Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into this book of Judges, chapter 9. This chapter goes to considerable depth, and I intend this time, the last time we taught it on television, I kind of skimmed the surface. This time we're going we're gonna to sink the plow right down to the beam. We're going to plow deep this time, so hang on. I will be, rather than translating, uh, transliterating the Hebrew, actually translating it so that you get a better understanding of the message your Father is conveying to you. So, let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Bear in mind that um, uh, Gideon has died. And Gideon left behind uh, 70 children plus one. Uh, we'll call him, for the sake of calling, an illegitimate child, all right? Uh, there is a difference between a mamzar and an illegitimate child. For, so for the time being, we're going to give the benefit of the doubt uh, and let you draw your own conclusions. The illegitimate child's name was Abimelech. And, and I think it's probably important you know what Abimelech means in the Hebrew tongue. It means son of the king. And that's a, a molech in the Hebrew being king. So he's got a pretty uh, powerful name, and the reason I want you to judge the difference, not necessarily, but between the illegitimate child and the Mamzar, is because many Philistine kings were named Abimelech. So that's kind of a strike against, be that as it may, and as much as Gideon had, had uh, this one maid that was from the area of Shechem. So, with that thought in mind, we pick up with the death of Gideon, and this is what follows. Chapter 9, verse 1. And Abimelech, this is the illegitimate child, the son of Jer Jerob Baal, that's the name of Gideon, which being fully translated means let Baal plead his own case, all right, went to, to Shechem unto his mother's brethren. In other words, the illegitimate child goes to the area where his mother uh, uh, lived and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying to speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whither is better for you either that all the sons of Jeroboam which, that's Gideon, which are threescore and ten persons, that's seventy of them, reign over you, or that one reign over you, question. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. Now, in the first place, at this time, the reason we have judges is there were no kings in Israel. The kings were among the Philistines, so on and so forth the uh, Baal worshiping and, uh, and other nations. But here we have the one already named king. It's obvious he is, he is pulling at the traces, wanting power, wanting to rule. Verse 3, And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, uh, Shechem in the Hebrew means the back or the shoulder, the shoulder, back shoulder, all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, he is our brother. Now, he'd made quite a case. And it is natural that, uh, spreading the story, you want all 70 of those people from down the way there to come into your nation and begin to rule you, or do you want one of your own to? It's real easy to stir up trouble through gossip, all right? Four. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver. How many pieces of silver is that? Seventy. Three score. Let me, let me figure that real quick. Sixty 
and ten is seventy, one for each of the children. Out of the house of Baal, Baal Berith, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. These were not good people. Now, it's important. Your father teaches on a level in depth that says a great deal more than is written. If you take the time to study, what does Baal, you all know what Baal means. That's the practice of worshiping Baal, which is Babel or Babylon. But what's this bereth in the Hebrew tongue? It's a very special word, covenant. In other words, this is covenant of Baal of the covenant or the covenant God. There's only one covenant our people are supposed to follow, and that is the covenant with the living God. So to add insult to injury, if you would, they go to the house of Baal, all right, but what's worse, that part of Baal that they would call the covenant maker. And he's going to make a covenant, not with Yahweh, the living God of Israel, of the world, the creator of all things, but he's going to serve under this covenant God who certainly is an enemy of our people. Now, verse 5, And he wept, I'm sorry, and he went unto his father's house at Ophrah. He goes from these people back to Ophrah, that's Gideon's uh, home and his area. Ophrah in the Hebrew tongue means fawn for gentleness here and slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, Gideon, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone, notwithstanding yet, Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, Gideon, was left, for he hid himself. Now, understand, let's do a little translating rather than transliterate. Jotham, the only true son left of Gideon, his name in the Hebrew tongue means Yah is upright. God is the only God. God is the only upright God or just God. That being this child's name. Now, <clears throat> what does 70 mean in biblical numerics? It's important. That's the message. God is setting the stage for you to see below the surface, even if you would in a prophetic sense, and as much as this is the type of how it would be at the end. Because what is the stone? All 70 killed on one stone. Our stone is our foundation. Our rock is Christ. Our rock is our Father. Not this false covenant God, Baal. Not false deception, or deception, that is to say, that would come in in the end times. What is the subject? With 70 being now repeated thrice, three times, for emphasis, and 70 in biblical numerics being to Israel's restoration, it's talking directly about the end times. For when is Israel, true Israel, and, and, and there's, there's more to this yet, what tribe are we speaking of here basically? What tribe was Gideon related to and akin to? Ephraim. One of the largest tribes, Shechem even, is mostly Ephraimites. The largest tribe of the ten tribes that went north over the Caucasus Mountain, the people later called Caucasians, the, those ten tribes, settling Europe and then later migrating to this great nation. Now we're talking about their rock, their covenant, and their restoration. Now, hang on. This gets deep, but you can handle it. No problem. Verse 6. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, and all the house of Milo. Milo simply means in the Hebrew tongue a rampart, or call it a mound. Like these, uh, uh, you could even say a, a little small hill or a place of worship. And he went and, and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. In the Hebrew manuscripts, this says by the oak, that famous oak tree. 
of uh, Sechem. There's a great deal of history, biblical history, even from Genesis, that takes place at this particular place. Seven. And when they told it to Jotham, this is the legitimate son of Gideon, he went and stood in the top of Mount uh, Gerizim, in the Hebrew tongue meaning the cutters. Same name as Gideon, the cutter downer, all right? And lifted up his voice and cried. And he said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. In other words, God, it may seem at times that the wicked get away with something. Don't worry, they don't. God will correct it, all right? And this legitimate one of the true covenant God, the one who is named Jotham, which is to say Yah, or God is upright, he's fair, and he's honest. Eight, the tree, he's going to use an analogy of trees, symbolic of people. Bear in mind, there's been no king yet, and that's important. Kings would come later with King Saul, because God would not accept him, Yahweh, as king. This is the analogy, this is the parable that the, the um, one named Yah is upright brings forth, and it is from God. Listen, the trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign over us. Now, I want to I hesitate here a moment to bring another thought in. You see, the book of Zechariah, from the ninth chapter especially to the end, has to do with the end time prophecy. The ninth chapter of Zechariah speaks of the false Messiah, both the first and second advent of Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah, Yeshua, and the fourteenth chapter relates as to exactly how it would come to pass. Now, there is a fascinating thing here in the Minor Prophets that in the ninth chapter of Zechariah that I choose to share with you. You're going to have it on, your, on the character generator. One verse that I wish to relate to you in this ninth chapter, which, as I forestated, gives both the first and second advent in the, New Te in the Old Testament, the Torah, of the coming of Messiah, both as a babe born in Bethlehem, uh, to bring and make salvation to the world, that is to say, to be crucified, riding a lowly ass. You will remember as he made his entry, which you find in the ninth verse of this ninth chapter. But in the tenth verse, he comes riding a white horse as King of kings and Lord of lords at the end of the earth. But what's back up here in the sixth verse? And it's important, and I'm going to use this to show you that the type is true. All right, the sixth verse of the ninth chapter of Zechariah, and it reads, And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. Now, what is, this word bastard is uh, the equivalent, mamzar in the Hebrew tongue, I prefer. First, you're going to have to use, I'm not going to define what it actually is, but... Uh, you can check it out in your Strong's Concordance, and you will find that there is a great difference between an illegitimate child and a bastard. Neither child suffers because of the parent's sins, but in oft times there is a great deal of embarrassment. But be that as it may, the word dwell, as it is utilized here, is yashab in the Hebrew tongue, and it means to sit as king, or to sit as ruler, to sit as judge. And what God is saying here is that an illegitimate, not, not, God is not saying illegitimate, He's saying a bastard, which is to say a memzar, will sit as king. Well, that's the type that you have back here in Abimelech. And so it shall be in the end times that the spurious Messiah shall come to this generation claiming to be the true Messiah and will deceive many, you happen to have an example of this very thing, of the false Messiah setting himself up as Jesus, only he is the instead of Christ, or as some prefer, Antichrist. So, there you have it. 
And perhaps if you do a little home study and you'll understand why I chose to use the word illegitimate child in as much as there were many Ephraimites as well as Philistines and foreigners in the area which would have made him a Mamzar. Verse 9. Back in chapter 9 of the great book of Judges, let us continue. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man? They use me as anointing oil and go to be promoted over the trees? Question. In other words, my purpose is far more useful than that. I am the oil or the tree by where you even go a little further for you deeper scholars. It even means that, that uh, the olive tree is symbolic of the two witnesses, even if you would, in the end times. That it was the olive oil that the virgins were supposed to have in their lamp. Eliyah in the, in the uh, Hebrew tongue. Olive oil. The olive tree said, no way. Verse, and naturally, this has to do with the false king being crowned. Verse 10, And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou, and reign over us. I would say at the same time, remember that the Lord God Almighty used the tree of the knowledge of good and evil even to be symbolic of Satan and his children in the garden as well as the tree of life being the Savior, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. It is not uncommon that trees are used symbolic of people. Throughout God's Word, this is done. Verse 11, as a matter of fact, Jesus healed a man that was blind at one time, and he, he said two different prayers, and many people in their ignorance say, well, Christ was losing his strength because of the sin that was around him. Recall that uh, incident. Christ blessed him, and he said, I can see men as trees walking. In other words, he could see deeper into the truths of God's Word and had understanding. And then he could see them clearly after Christ touched him, meaning God's Word revealed itself in his mind. Verse 11, But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? Question. Fig tree says, Not me, boy. 12. Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. 13. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine? which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Well, how could it cheer God? That's terrible for someone to say something. Well, you're talking about God's Word. God's the one that said it through this parable. Because His Son, only begotten Son's blood, would be symbolic of that very wine. 14. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. Do you know what bramble is? It's thorns. Thorn bushes, always symbolic of Satan. God uses thorns to drive his own people. I just finished a, a, a lecture on that very subject uh, on a single tape. Bramble, thorn bush. Listen carefully and learn from your father. 15. And the bramble, that's to say the thorn bush, said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. In other words, put your love, your knowledge, worship, trust, put everything in me and come into my shadow. And if not... If you won't do it, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon have always been symbolic of those trees in the Garden of Eden, God's children. Did you get it? Are you, have you ever been out in nature? Have you ever seen a thorn bush? Have you ever seen it put out a shadow? No, you haven't. It doesn't. He's lying. If you come into the shadow of the thorn bush, you get no comfort from the hot sun. And if you come under Satan's shadow of his deception, you're not going to get any relief from the heat of the world itself. You're going to be deceived, and every time you pray, if you're praying to a spurious Messiah, your prayers will not be answered, 
and you'll be protected about as like someone would trying to cool themselves in the shadow of a thorn bush. All you would end up doing is getting, being stuck and injured and driven away. That's Abimelech for you. The Manzar son of Gideon being the type of he that would take the first woman from the field, as Christ warned about in Matthew 24. Taught by many already deceived, saying, Well, I want to be one of the first ones to go. And if you read it as a child would read it, rather than that that is instilled from churchosity and religionist, you know it's Satan that takes the first one from the field. The bramble bush. time people woke up. You better stop playing church and get into God's Word and pray for a little knowledge and understanding from the simple messages and the simplicity in which Christ Himself taught and brings His truth. Hey, I'm only responsible for teaching it. If you want to fall under the shade of the thorn bush, have at it, friend. It's all right with me. Be deceived if you enjoy being deceived. But it's time some came out into the truth. Verse 16. Now, therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely in that you have made Abimelech king, and if ye have dwelt well with Jerob Baal, that's to say uh, Gideon, and his house, they murdered him. What do you mean done well? And have done unto him according to the deserving of his hand. 17. For my father fought for you. Gideon, when everybody was captive under the Bedouins that you could have said boo to and they would have ran, Gideon made a difference. One man stood up and freed his people. He was a champion. He said, And adventure his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Median. And look what you've done to him. That's what he's saying. You killed all his seed, all but one, the one speaking, Jotham, 18. And ye are risen up against my father's house this day, and have slain his sons, threescore and ten persons, upon one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, Manzar or illegitimate, whichever the case, king over the men of Shechem. Because he is your brother. I'm telling you, you've been had and you don't even know it. 19. If you then have dwelt, dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam, Gideon, and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. 20. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo, and devour Abimelech. Does that remind you of something, let fire come out from within? It should remind you of Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 18, where Satan, as the king of Tyre, is announced from God's own lips to die with fire, with being turned to ashes from within. That this is symbolic of He, the only one that has already been judged by Almighty God to perish. Though the event has not come to pass and will not until the great judgment. The son of perdition, there's only one. Perdition in the Greek means to perish. Already been judged. Only one, Satan. It should remind you of that, and you should see the type, or you're blind, my friend, and you will never see the truth. You have the type and the stage set, a perfect enactment. As Paul would teach in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, these things of the Old Testament happened as an ensample or an example in modern English, whereby you would know what would befall you at the ends of the world. You awake? Verse 21, And Jothan ran away and fled, and he went to Beer. Beer, the oath, or the well. 
in the Hebrew, and he dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. He didn't have to worry a whole lot. God would keep his hand on him. 22. When Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel, now listen to me. How many years is the Spirit's Messiah supposed to reign? Hmm? How many? Three. Three and a half. Six months from his end. You got it? Now wake up for me. Pay attention. 23. Your documentation from the New Testament, Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, 4 and 5. 42 months, which Satan's times and prophecies relating to him are always in months, which is moons, which means night. Prophecies relating to God's children are in days, meaning solar, sun, light. Got it? Okay, let's roll. 23. And God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dwelt treacherously, dealt treacherously with Abimelech. See, cheating don't pay, friend. And there are no unsolved mysteries in heaven. God knows. And you're going to get paid. Pay me now, pay me later. God sent an evil spirit. I didn't know God would do that. You bet he will. It isn't that difficult. God only has to allow it. Satan's over-anxious to send one of his little friends. 24. That the cruelty done to the threescore and ten sons of Jeroboam might come, and their blood be laid upon Abimelech their brother, which slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren. Now, you never get away with anything in this world. God loves to bless his children. When you're awake, when you're alert, the blessings flow. And sometimes even when we try to give a blessing, we end up being blessed more ourselves. I always get a thrill from that. 25. And the men of Shechem set liars in wait for him. They were along the roadway. So this kind of men they were dealing with, okay? In wait for uh, in the top of the mountains, and they robbed all that came along that way by them. And it was told to Bimelech. They're out to get you, Bimelech, son. You're king, all right, but they're, they want your gizzard. 26. And Geal, the son of Ebed, stone, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. Hey, let us tell you what's happening here, bro. 27. And they went out into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God. Remember who that was? The covenant, Baal, and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. The very thing Abimelech, and don't forget what the word means, and the name means in the Hebrew tongue, okay? The father of the king. He just wants to be a king. 28. And Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? And who is Shechem? That we should serve him. Is not he the son of Jeroboam? Is he not the son of Gideon? What's he doing here? And Zebel, his officer, served the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. For why should we serve him? You see, you had a lot of these misfits, mongrels, that lived in this area, and truth always comes out. God can either protect, or He can allow people to destroy themselves. And they're not too long about doing it with their lives daily, if they don't know what the score is, how to receive blessings from God. 29. And would to God this people were under my hand, then would I remove Abimelech. And he said to Abimelech, Increase thine army and come out. In other words, let's get it on. Come on, Abimelech, make my day. 30. In other words, ill-gotten gains never profiteth thee. All right? 
spoken in eloquently in Old English. 30, verse 30. And when Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gael, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled. The old general under Abimelech says, All right, I've got the challenge. 31. And he sent messengers unto Abimelech, privily, saying, Behold, Gael, the son of Ebed, and his brethren, be come to Shechem, and behold, they fortify the city against thee. They're ready to fight. 32. Now, therefore, up by night, thou and the people uh, that is with thee, and lie in wait in the field. Good general, all right? He's got it planned out pretty well. 33. And it shall be that in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, thou shalt rise early and set up on the city. And behold, when he and the people that is with him come out against thee, then mayest thou do to them as thou shalt find occasion. In other words, he moved, the general moved them to the point of advantage put the troops in position in the night, rest, but before they have time to get organized, hit them. All right? Good general. 34. And Abimelech rose up, and all the people that were with him by night, and they laid wait against Sechem in four companies, all directions. Good general. All right? Good strategy. 35. And Gael, the son of Ebed, went out, stood in the entering of the gate of the city, and Abimelech rose up and the people that were with him from lying in wait. They were ready to make their move. 36. And when Gael saw the people, he said to Zebal, Behold, look, there come people down from the top of the mountain, the point of advantage, okay? And Zebal said unto him, Thou seest the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. Go on with you. Get the coffee made. All right. You're just imagining things. 37. And Gael spoke again and said, See, there come people down by the middle of the land, and another company come along by the plain of Neonium. All right. 38. Then said Zebel unto him, Where is now thy mouth? Wherewith thou saidest, Who is Abimelech? That we should serve him. Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Get out, I pray now, and fight with them. You go do it, all right? You go fight with them. 39, and Gael went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech, getting it on now. 40, and Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many were overthrown and wounded even unto the entering of the gate. Quite a slaughter. 41. And Abimelech dwelt at Arumah, and Zebul thrust out uh, Gael and his brethren that they should not dwell in Shechem. Got him in a bunch of trouble, all right? 42. And it came to pass on the morrow that the people went out into the field, and they told Abimelech. 43. And he took the people and divided them into three companies, and laid wait in the field, and looked, and behold, the people were come forth out of the city. And he rose up against them, and smote them. 44. And Abimelech, and the company that was with him, rushed forward, and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And the two other companies ran upon all the people that were in the fields, and slew them. Abimelech's giving them a pretty good working over, all right? Good strategy. It would look like the bad guy is about to win, okay? 45, and Abimelech fought against the city all that day. And he took the city and slew the people that were therein and beat down the city and sowed it with salt. First time it had been done in the Bible. It was re-cleansed again later in history. But that means that's nothing will grow in salt, got it? Never to be rebuilt as a city again unless it's cleansed. 46, and when all the men of the Tower of Sechem heard that, uh, that they entered into and hold of the house of the god Berith. Got it? Berith, remember? Hebrew what? Covenant. The god of the covenant. Now, hey, notice the small g, though. Our father, Yahweh, is the god of the covenant. Watch false religion. 
Christianity is not a religion, it's reality. Be careful, my friend. 47. And it was told to Bimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. 48. And Abimelech got him up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people that were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand, watch this now, and cut down a bough from, uh, from the trees, a limb, and took it and laid it on his shoulder and said unto the people that were with him, What ye have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. Each one of you cut you off a limb, throw it over your shoulder. 49. And all the people likewise cut down every man his bow and followed Abimelech and put them to the hole and set the hole on fire upon them so that all the men of the tower of Sechem died also, about a thousand men and women. In other words, they crawled in a hole and they threw the limbs in on top of them and set them on fire. And it would appear that... Um, that uh, the legitimate son's prayer that fire destroy this wicked one is just backfiring all over the place, does it not? Then went Abimelech to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and took it, doing good, 51. But there was a strong tower within the city, and, and thither fled all the men and women and all they of the city and shut it to them and got them up to the top of the tower. Boy, old Bimelech got them all gathered in a pile again. And Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard into the door of the tower to burn it with fire. 53, God at work. And a certain woman, woe man, woman, cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. Cracked him like an egg. All right? Just to make it real interesting and graphic for you here, okay? 54. And he called hastily to the young men, his armor bearer, and he said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men, shall not, uh, shall, that men say not of me, a woman slew him. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. I mean, logistically, Abimelech, a very wise person, well, he probably had a wiser general that was the, the military uh, strategist here, got the victory into the last throes of it. And a woman, which I've always said they're stronger, and uh, make better warriors anyway, be that as it may, in certain cases, killed him. The armor buyer may have finished him off, but the woman killed him. That's God's hand fulfilling the prophecy. 55. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. 56. Thus God, who? Who's in control? Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father, Gideon, in slaying his seventy brethren, restoration of Israel, seventy, fifty-seven. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of of Jeroboam, which is to say Gideon. What did God do? Now, let's, let's grab that. Don't let it get away from you. It may have looked like that Abimelech was winning, and he was. But what he was doing was destroying the very people that he covenanted with and their God to destroy the true sons and rightful heirs of judgment to be a judge. And God let them destroy each other by allowing one wicked, evil spirit of gossip and hate to enter into the community. And the community destroyed itself. God allowed it. God engineered it. And wickedness, evilness. What's in the name? Abimelech. Father of the king, a kingly line. And he was a man's heart. 
Beware of the Manzar that shall dwell as king. I will even say it in a different way. Beware of the Manzar that pretends to be the king of kings, for it will happen in and to this generation. You have had it enacted before your very eyes exactly how it shall come to pass using these types, prototypes, and analogies, yet being documented throughout the Word of God. Put all your trust in the thorn bush, honey, if you want to. But you'll never, never, it will be as the crown of thorns that they placed on Yeshua's head, which drew nothing but blood. You will never be happy there. Get rather into your Father's Word. I'll tell you this, when you plow deep in our Father's Word, you see the simplicity in which Christ taught. What am I saying? True wisdom is to simplify the Word of God whereby everybody can understand it. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please?